Today's reading is in uh, ch uh, chapter 17, Acts, verses uh, 16 through 34. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, Who does this babbler want? What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and, his de and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysus, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Curious what provokes you. I'm curious, actually, if you even use the word provoke, but I'm sure we all know the experience of being provoked. So what provokes you? What is it that reaches out and touches you in such a way that it, that it hits a nerve, it stirs certain emotions, and motivates follow-on um, activities or, or words? And so even the most measured, cool, chill among us, um, we have those things that do provoke us. Uh, so maybe, maybe it's your family being harassed. No, sir. No, ma'am. You will not do that. Uh, maybe it's the flag, somebody dishonoring the, the flag of the United States of America, and you get upset. It provokes you. Um, could be injustice. It could be suffering. There's any number of things that will just be used in some manner to, to reach out, touch the nerve, stir an action or stir a, a word back in response to what we have seen, heard, experienced in that moment. In Acts chapter 17, as Jim just read for us here, we read that the Apostle Paul was provoked 
within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And the, the root idea of what uh, Luke is communicating here is uh, Paul was prodded with this, with this irritation. And the irritation was intended to compel him, lunge him forward to say and do something about what he, what he saw, what he was experiencing. And so when I say provoke, do not picture the friend who claims to be funny that pokes you in the ribs just to get a giggle. That's not what we're talking about here. This is something sharp. This is something irritating. This is something that's intended to make the man of God profoundly uncomfortable, and he cannot sit still and pretend he's no longer seeing and experiencing what he's actually seeing and experiencing. So in Acts 17, we, we see that the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul found himself in the city of Athens, and he's all alone. Once, Athens once was the historical hub, the cultural hub, the, the governmental hub of the empire. But now it had dwindled down to one singular purpose. It was the, the religious or the idolatrous hub of the empire. And now as Paul alone finds himself there walking through the city, taking in all that he's seeing, we, we, should, we should envision the Holy Spirit is walking with him. The Holy Spirit leans over to him, pokes him and says, notice what's here. Paul, don't ever forget this. Paul, don't diminish this. Don't minimize this. I am working. Yes, you should be uncomfortable. Say something. Do something. And so remember years prior when Jesus looked out across Jerusalem that he wept. He wept because they had the truth but didn't want it. And now we find the messenger of Christ looking out across Athens. He's not weeping in the same way, but he stirred emotionally because the people of Athens wanted the truth, but they didn't yet have it. But all that was about to change. So as we now maybe dive more into Acts 17, verses 16 through 34, we're going to see some essentials to being a gospel witness in the world. I've noticed four essentials for being a gospel witness in the world. And so Athens, again, the hub of culture once the hub of culture was now the home of the largest collection of idols that anyone had ever seen on the planet. There were, there were temples and shrines, there were statues and idols everywhere you would look. It's estimated that there were over 100,000 statues scattered all across uh, this, this town here, maybe, maybe three miles wide. You have to believe Paul had never seen anything like Athens before. And what he saw, again, provoked within him. The, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. I remember being provoked even before I knew the Lord. I uh, didn't mean to, but I found my way into a Buddhist temple in Seoul, South Korea, and it was deeply disturbing. Several years later, I got the opportunity to go to New York City on a mission trip, and I was provoked time after time after time. One time, because we, land, or we drove into Manhattan on Sunday, and it was, the, it was the gay pride parade, and my heart was broken. But just two days later, I was down at the New York Stock Exchange, and I saw a different love and a different passion, and my heart was provoked. Days after that, I was in Yankee Stadium watching the Yankees play the Mariners, and my heart was provoked. As I saw worship, as I saw passion, I left each of those not expecting that experience. And right in the middle of that week, we met in, a, in, a, in a, a beautiful, beautiful Episcopal cathedral. And my spirit was provoked at the creative instincts of man. And what's, what once filled that room with praise and now just seemed absolutely devoid of the love of God. What provokes you? Just a few weeks ago, I was able to hike to the top of the Black Mountain right over here. Unexpectedly, I was provoked again as I looked out across this area and I saw all the people, all the cars, all the movement, all the business, all the wealth, all the dreams, all the hopes, even claiming if you live here, you can be carefree. And my heart was stirred as I saw the shrines. I saw the temples, I saw the idols, 
I saw the statutes all around us. So we're not that much different than Athens. Except for us, the temples and the shrines, they seem to have wheels on them, don't they? They're four-wheel vehicles. And maybe we drive a dually. <laughs> maybe it's, a, it's an RV to get us going. But it's a 2,000-square-foot house that now seems small to us. You look and see all the golf courses. You see all the bars. You see all the coffee shops. You see all the spas and the resorts all around us. We have, we have gun ranges and all of these opportunities to go and just be something that's meaningful to us. But the idols are like rest or comfort or completion or significance, authority. Respect, peace. And we strive and strive and strive, taking God's good gifts like wealth or health and turning them into gods themselves that we serve and we absolutely must preserve. So we're not that different from Athens. And the question I'm asking is does it provoke us when we look around? It's possible some of us have grown so accustomed to them, we don't even notice them anymore. It's possible we've even begun to serve them just like the community all around us. Does it provoke you still that people around us are in bondage to false gods? I'm sure it did at one point. I'm sure it does at certain times. Does it still provoke you? Does it still provoke you that people are giving to false gods what our God alone deserves? Is the spirit groaning within you about that? Paul saw it. He took inventory. He was provoked and he had to say something. He had to be a witness in Athens. So again... As we make our way through four essentials to being a gospel witness in the world. Verses 16 through 21, we will notice now that Paul met people where they were. The Apostle Paul met them where they were. And in order, order for us to be a good, faithful gospel witness, in large measure, it means we have to be where people are. So we, let's join again now in reading in verse 17. Uh, it says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So we have to picture this scene uh, as Paul has been making his way on this second missionary journey through persecution and through wise counsel. The missionary team has dwindled down to one man alone in Athens. And so he has a lot of free time on his hand. He's got a lot of relational time on his hand. And instead of staying isolated, he's out among the people. He's out in the marketplaces. He's taking inventory of what's happening and his heart is stirred. And so it says that he went to the local synagogue where the Jews would be assembling. But he also went into the marketplace. And it says he did these things every day because that's where the Greeks would be assembling. Day after day after day, he went to where the people were already going. Listen, we know this. It's good to be reminded of this. If we want to tell the world about Jesus, we have to go so often to where they go. Right? I, I just, as a word of, brief, brief word of testimony, I think by my involvement with, a, with two baseball teams, I have shared the gospel more in the last year than, a, than a, every time I have as pastor of Black Mountain Baptist Church for six years. By just being out with the people. Not what the pastor had on, but just as the neighbor had or the dad had or the friend had. So we just, what I'm getting at is it's amazing how the spirit will work in your heart and someone else's heart when you get in proximity to that man, that woman, right where they are. So ask, where are the people of our community gathering? Where are they going? What are these natural connection points? Think of all the restaurants. Think of all the bars, the honky tonks. You still call them that? I just think of the music venues as you drive north into Cave Creek. Notice how many coffee shops there are 
We're not that big of a community. But I guess there's probably 12. If you drew a three-mile circle around this church, there's probably 12 coffee shops. Maybe you guys are like super particular about your coffee. I don't taste the difference most of the time. Like this, I just learned about a place in Carefree called, I think it's called Gears and Grinders. Is that what it's called? It's like a bike shop, coffee shop, which for some of us is heaven on earth. <laughs> and then just south of that, behind, behind some stores, there's this little coffee shop tucked away called like J- Janie's, Janie's Cafe or something. Is that what it's called? I had no idea they existed. I'm just doing my life and I'm like, oh, that seems cool. So you know what I did? I went in. I bought coffee. I worked. I asked a name. Starting to befriend people. That is, I don't have to ask you, come here. I'll go to where you are because people have their rhythms, don't they? They go to their favorite shop, their favorite restaurant, their favorite golf course, their favorite rodeo, their favorite, their favorite. Why? Because there's a sense of community there. There's a sense of belonging. There's a sense of identity. It's like my people when you walk in the room and, and, and they know you and you know them. And I'm saying we have that here. Glory to God. But he wants us to take it out there. To be among his people giving winsome testimony to Jesus Christ. Do we have to love what they love? No. Do we have to enjoy all the things they enjoy? No. But can we love that person and befriend that person and and serve and in time give testimony? Sure. So maybe for you, maybe your testimony of God's salvation means you belong in the bar sober. Go. Go. To the glory of God and befriend the drunks who need the hope that you have. And maybe for you, God's given you like incredible hand-eye coordination. You can take that little white ball that irritates the snot out of most of us and smack it straight down the middle of the fairway. Go to the glory of God because he's given you that skill and befriend them. Maybe it's rodeo. Okay, I don't get it. But our community gets it, and so do you. Go. And don't feel bad about being there. But be there as a light to represent Christ. Be where the people are. That's all Paul's doing here. He went to those places, those natural assemblies, and he, as he had opportunity, he reasoned with them about the meaning of life, about the hope of life. That is, verse 8 tells us, in those opportunities, he preached Jesus and the resurrection. Let's, let's keep reading here, beginning in verse 18. Some of the Epicureans, uh, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul in the marketplace is giving testimony to Jesus. It creates some sort of buzz and they take him now and and they they bring him uh, by the hand of these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And these are two groups within the community. So maybe we would say like like the the rodeo and uh, the educated wealthy people. I don't know. But just like imagine two separate groups of people in our community. In Athens, the Epicureans... These were men and women that believed the cosmos were created, was created by accident. Kind of like an ancient Big Bang, like naturalistic type of thing. And, um, and there is a God, though, that has involvement with the world only to kind of nudge it back on path because man has a way of getting it off path. And so this unknown God of some kind would just come and nudge things in a new and better direction. But... but What's key is that God had no interaction, no personal interaction with the, with, the, uh, with the cosmos itself. And so I read somewhere that this, um, this would be similar because, because everything had a natural explanation. Uh, they, they minimized pain. So they, they really had no tolerance for you feeling sorry for yourself. 
Like you just need a new thought, a better thought. Think higher and you'll feel better. And uh, it's kind of a mix between like modern day naturalist and Christian scientist, which footnote one is neither Christian nor science, just so you know. It's just some weird made up faith. The Stoics, we probably have heard, they were kind of high-minded, composed people. They did, did believe that God created and then just kind of walked away. So it had nothing else to do with. It's now running its natural course. So in some way, they were kind of a, a modern-day progressive, enlightened person, and a, and a measure of maturity is self-control. I, as, I, as I read about Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, you know, what I, you know what I honestly wrote down? I do not like these people. I would find them weird and irritating, like kind of a little too high-minded for me. I, I don't like them. And we have to know Paul did not agree with them. But he still addressed them. He still spoke to them. He still ministered to them. That's where we find them. And so they mock him. They call him a babbler. And that's, that's a really cutting word where, where it's a slander saying, you're basically an intellectual scavenger. Like, you don't even know what you're talking about. You're taking a little bit from here and a little bit from here and a little bit from here, and then, and then you don't even know how to process it and line it up, and you're just spewing out this nonsense that is incoherent. You're basically a, a philosophical dog. Who's this babbler? Stop it. But others seemed a little more interested, curious, and they said, what you're saying is strange. We don't quite know how it plays out. Will you, will you share more? And they usher him to the Areopagus, which... Uh, some of you have heard it called Mars Hill. Anybody ever heard this called Mars Hill? Yeah. So the Areopagus is like a church. It's both a place and a people. So the place is most often correlated with a, 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 a high uh, public speaking area called Mars Hill. Maybe it was in a hall. We don't know exactly. But it was also a council. It was a community uh, democratic type of council that basically would hear people's claims and they would make judgments. And so they could they could dismiss or they could... They could uh, bring on uh, whippings or even all the way to the point of execution, depending on what the teaching is and what the, the, the teacher was calling for. Well, Paul went to the marketplace and he's preaching the resurrection and, and, and they draw him into this council now to give an account. And how he responds to this is so informative that leads us to this second essential. First, we want to meet people where they are. As we jump into 22, what's also important is that when possible, we find points of agreement when possible. And I think I just like poured something bitter into some of our mouths. When possible, we need to find points of agreement with those we're aiming to share the gospel with. As we read this, I want you, I'm praying you, you're able to notice how courteous the apostle Paul is when he speaks to these men in this council here. So beginning in verse 22, so Paul, now standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he's no longer seated in the synagogue, he's standing, standing among these people. He said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What you therefore worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So do you see what he did right here? The Apostle Paul, led by the Spirit, acknowledged common ground. He acknowledged a shared experience. He said, I can see that we have similar ambition. And what did he acknowledge as common? What was the shared ambition? Worship. He, he, in other words, he's saying, I believe, I believe your motives are true. You're recognizing you are not God. That there is God or gods that you aspire to some degree to properly honor. I see that with you. So again, he's commending them. He's finding a point of agreement in which he can say, I want to unite for a moment. Now, I guess it's possible Paul could have acted like so many of us act from time to time, which seems to be very common today. Let's be snarky and condemning at the outset. Like, he could have said, you call my gospel strange? You think I'm the babbler? Watch me now deconstruct how nonsensical everything you believe. 
Let me show you where illogic is. Like he could have taken that approach. Instead, he takes the Christ-like approach and he's speaking with honor towards those that are absolutely wrong in false worship. I'm just, I'm laying my heart out for you, church. One of the big struggles of my heart today is finding a home in present Western evangelical churches. Western evangelical faith is way too much like a political party for me. It takes the mood, it takes the tone, it takes the posture of what we see on television more than what we see in the scriptures. So when Jesus tells us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, or to, if they strike your cheek, give them the other, we say, yeah, that day's past, Jesus. This is unprecedented. It's time to be like Peter and take up the sword. And I say, no. Jesus knew what he was talking about. The scriptures are sufficient. The way to life is death to self. And Paul here is modeling Christ-like love and humility. He affirms whatever he can affirm He says, I see that you are a worshiper. I see that to some desire you desire, uh, uh, to to some extent you desire to be faithful. I want to ask you, I want to ask you a serious question. Do you think you have anything in common with an LGBTQ neighbor? Or an LGBTQ affirmer? Do you have anything in common with them? Do you have anything in common with Perhaps someone very close to you that is pro-abortion. Can you fathom that you share more than you realize? Because I'm saying, if we would actually show humility and love and patience, and we would listen, we would befriend, it would not take long for us to realize that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and powers and principalities of darkness, right? That our neighbor's our neighbor, a fellow image bearer, that yes, they may, they're wrong about many things. But maybe what you're going to realize, not always, not absolutely, but maybe what you're going to realize is you both share a desired outcome of love. A desired outcome of relief of suffering, of mercy. While you fundamentally disagree about how that happens. And the devil and our pride often doesn't let us get there. Because we see them as enemies, as despicable, and there's nothing they could say to me that I would benefit from. This past week, I was sharing the gospel with a, uh, with a man that I'll just say he was glad to give me the reasons he is not a Christian. He was quick and clear on why what I believe and try to embrace with my life was wrong. I gave him the space, I listened to him, and almost, like I can't think of an exception, his reasons for not being a Christian were cultural and social. That is, it was professing Christians that had so wounded his heart, he wanted nothing to do with the one that professing Christians claimed to be following. And you know what I said to him? Sir, I don't agree absolutely, but some of that is true. And for that, I'm sorry. On behalf of Christians, I'm sorry that we have misrepresented Christ. I am sorry that we have spoken with arrogance. I am sorry that we have been impatient. But sir, please do not hold that against my dear Lord because he is not that way. We have misrepresented him. Well, I was thinking we're building some common ground and things were going to go a good direction. But again, he just doubled down to let me know how wounded he was and so forth. And he's a moving target. And so he moved it over to abortion. This man is pro-abortion. He gives me all these reasons and I hear them out. And I I agreed with part of what he said. uh, Certainly, I hope you know, I don't agree with all that he said. And he finished, he'd like run himself tired. (laughs) Praise the Lord. (laughs) And I said, uh, I do want you to think about that any society 
that would give support and permission for ending an unborn life in time will give support and permission for ending someone that they don't deem fit to be alive. So, for example, it could be an elderly person. It could be a physically uh, uh, disabled person. It could be something with uh, a person with mental. Like, I just went down this list and just shared in time, like, the problem is not just preborn. It's everyone will find themselves in the crosshairs. Ironically, this gentleman shared he has stage four cancer. It seems terminal. But somehow he validated he should continue to live. Even though he knows he's not working, not able to contribute anymore. And there became the window. No, no, no. The doorway. For me to talk about the Lord and his love and his compassion. It was the long way around the barn, full of emotion. But we got there. And I shared the gospel with him. He made no profession of faith. I could tell he was troubled and chewing. He had never reckoned with the mercy of God in Christ and the love of God. He had only seen it polluted through the church and it wounded him. And I'm asking that you pray for him. The reason I tell that story is... If I laid out my life and values, his life and values, you probably wouldn't see overlap. But in the context of being where this man was, befriending him, giving him the space to share, it took a while, but I found common ground. And you know what it was? You want to live, don't you? You don't want to die today. You don't want this cancer to be the end. You don't want your son to be an orphan. And that the hope of life, became the route, because I shared that, he shares that. And that became the doorway to walk through to say, let me tell you about my dear Lord. So when possible, and I tried all week to think about when would it not be possible. I didn't come up with one yet, but I'm still comfortable saying when possible, find a point of agreement. The men and women of Athens were wrong, but they were not absolutely wrong. They sought to worship, and that was right. And Paul met them right there, and he says, worship is the connection. I'll begin right there, moving now into this third uh, essential of explaining the gospel. Meet them where they are. Agree where you can. Use that as a doorway into explaining the gospel. I'm going to read Paul's sermon or message to them in its entirety. I... uh, I actually started this sermon and I had like nine points. And I said, there's just no time. Uh, I think I could preach one sermon on each sentence of Paul's message to them. I think there's enough in these. The Holy Spirit allowed the Apostle Paul to cover a lot of ground. We're not going to handle it that way this morning. You can go back and read and pray through it and let your heart just burst with worship and joy in the Lord. But read with me now. Beginning in verse 23. So Paul is speaking. He said, as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
This is now out in the marketplace. He's sharing the gospel, preaching Jesus and his resurrection, now being ushered into this council to give an account for this strange babbling that he's doing here. And notice where he did not start. It was not the law. It was not the prophets. It was not sin or righteousness or any of that. In this moment, in the secular pluralistic society, the Apostle Paul started with creation. And from there, he began to explain the gospel, even appealing to their own already existing beliefs. I think surprising to some of us, Paul did not quote the scriptures here, did he? What did the Apostle Paul quote when preaching out in the marketplace? He quoted their poets. That's like the ancient version of quoting a song lyric. Like, come on, you guys sing it. You already know it. He's leaning on what's already valid in their hearts to say in some manner, hey, y'all, you've got a shadow of Christ right there. Flip on the lights, turn the spotlight right there from Christ, so Christ is no longer in the shadows, but center stage. And through the proclamation of Christ, this gospel, all the shadows are cast out. Again, building rapport, meeting them where they are, establishing we share these things. Come on, y'all, you already say. That's what he's doing in this moment. But he's saying those are just simply shadows. Let me show you the substance. And so he says in verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This sermon began by, by Paul speaking about creation, having an origin, God coming and working through a man in verse 26. And this sermon ends by God, uh, Paul uh, saying that God will bring to completion this work through a second man. God will judge at the end all of this through a different man, a resurrected man, the Christ man. And it says he fixed a day on which he will judge the world including Athens, including Cave Creek and the surrounding communities, will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, of this uh, uh, decision to judge by a man, he has given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. That is, the groping, the stumbling, the philosophical debating, the deflecting of this world is no longer okay. God is no longer unknown. Now, this point forward, they would sin with eyes wide open. No longer good intention, but misplaced application. Every other idol must be torn down. Every other temple must be torn down. Every other shrine must be torn down. There's only one. And it's the one that you set up as unknown just to be safe. That unknown God has made himself known to you on this day. There were times of ignorance in which God overlooked that. But those times have passed. God, the true God, the only God, isn't unknown. I was sharing the gospel with a man just recently. And this was the conversation we had. You've had, this is how I was helping him see this God and this God and this God and this God, all these objects of hope, 
All these, all these things that you keep propped up that you think if you can get close to, then you will have peace. So if you can get that certain, that certain accomplishment, then you'll have peace. If you can get that certain community and their, and their uh, 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 appreciation of you, then you will have peace. And I was saying what happens in those moments is the Lord in his love comes to you and he takes his arm and he sweeps every one of those off the table and there's only one standing right there. And he is saying, will you trust me alone? And sadly, the young man said, no. I just don't believe that Jesus is enough. And it wounded me, but I appreciate his honesty and clarity. Pray for that young man. What we're seeing here. As Paul is enabled by the Spirit to knock down over 100,000 statutes. And he is saying, God came to us in his Son. The unknown God has revealed himself through his Son. The Word of God made flesh and that Son lived. Perfect. However you want to define perfect in righteousness, he is perfect. And they hated him for his perfection. They hated him for his love and his mercy. And so they killed him. Because their hearts were wicked. And they loved the darkness more than the light. They killed him. And three days later, he rose. And they tried everything they could to spin it as though he didn't die or somebody's pretending or whatever. It's nonsense. One of my boys recently asked me, Dad, and I appreciate his honesty. Dad, how do we know this is true? It's just like a young heart trying to make sense of these things. How do we know these are true? And I was like, Lord, help me. <laughs> and almost immediately, what the Lord brought to mind was the resurrection, son. I don't know how often you think about that. Jesus Christ of Nazareth rose from the grave. And everything changed. He paid our sin debt. So much so that he didn't need to keep dying. It is finished. And he rose again. And he ministered. He restored Peter. Hallelujah. On behalf of all the Peters of the world, Lord, thank you for restoration. And he commissioned us to go and proclaim this news wherever it is he places us. Tell people about Jesus. Start where they are and walk them through the goodness of God and the righteousness of God and the holiness of God and the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the completion in Christ, the fulfillment of the law, the resurrection of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the, the, the receiving of righteousness and dwelling of the Holy Spirit, the hope that is like an anchor established, settled in heaven. And we cry out, how long, O Lord, until you return? The resurrection gives us assurance while we wait. But the resurrection gives assurance that judgment is coming. Which leads to the fourth essential. Call for a response. He models this for us here in verses 30 and following. But the Apostle Paul says the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by whom uh, uh, he, uh, he has appointed um, uh, by a man whom he has appointed of this. He has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul was kind of blunt now. He starts with this common ground, this word of commenda commendation, but he comes to this blunt reality. Friends, please hear me. God commands all people everywhere to repent. And the reason I'm, I'm slowing down, being measured, is because I'm aware some of us have heard it so often, it's lost its sobriety. 
that's lost its weight to us. But being God, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, He has the right to command all people everywhere to repent. The other reason I share it is there's a form of modern Christianity that says you don't have to repent. You just believe. And friends, let me hear, uh, I want you to hear me say when Jesus began his public ministry, the first words recorded out of his mouth was repent and believe the gospel. It's not one or the other, it's both. And when he commissioned his 12 to first go out two by two, actually it was larger than that, 40, to go out two by two, the first words out of their mouth was repent. There is no positive faith in God until there is a turning from the false worship. Repent. He commands this of all people everywhere. Turn. So, hey, Athens, you can't be pluralistic anymore. You can't have this one altar over here and this one altar over there. They're all gone. There's one. And it's the altar of God. It's the cross of Christ. It's the empty tomb. And again, for us, you think about our shrines and our temples. Think about how many baseball fields or soccer fields. Those are places of worship, aren't they? Think about how many car dealerships, jewelry stores. Again, honky-tonks, places of worship. We think we can have both. There's one God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, who is Lord over all. And we will take a good gift like golf and make it a God if Jesus does not stand alone in our hearts. Or a good gift like wealth and all of the fruit that comes from it and make it a God if Jesus does not stand alone in our hearts. And this call is to turn from those things as objects of worship and let God be God. Again, Paul was provoked that God was being robbed and these people were in bondage. And he had to say something. And the, what he's calling them to is to turn from, to turn to Jesus. Otherwise, face the right judgment of God. Do you hear me right now? Turn to the only right God. The only God. Or face judgment one day. Judgment is going to happen. And either one will be hidden in Christ, the ark of our salvation, or will be naked and exposed under that judgment of God. And the Apostle Paul, led by the Spirit, said this beautiful word to these people. May we hear it. God determined the allotted periods and boundaries of your dwelling place. That you should seek God. Perhaps feel your way toward Him and find Him. And He's actually not far from you. Your life has followed God's glorious, creative, and providential design. Because He loves you. Because He wants you to know Him. Now, I hear that as a wounded man. As I could tell you stories. You have your stories of heartache and sorrow and devastation. And we pray, Lord, is there any other way? And in some manner, the, the word from heaven is, no. This is the way that draws you close. This is the way that wakes you from your drunken stupor of that world. And I'm right here with you. 
So just try this one on for a moment. God brought you here today. You had the instinct to get out of bed, put on your clothes, and brush your hair or shave your head, depending on what you got going. And you made it on time by divine appointment. And that does not minimize your freedom. That does not minimize your sorrow or grief. But it, it magnifies the love of God in Christ. You and I needed to be in a church that would proclaim as best as they could Acts chapter 17 verses 30, 16 through 34 on this day in this moment of your life. So some of you are in and out of our church. Okay. God will sort that out. Today you're in for a reason. And that reason is, he's saying, I want you to know me more. Don't look at him because I'm talking to you too. I want you to know. That's what the Lord is saying to every blessed one of us today. And the way we do it is turning from whatever it is, that distraction, and turning back to the Lord saying, I believe. Now, Paul, in calling them to repentance, he was blunt, he was awkward, he was, he was not socially cool any longer, and some, therefore, mocked him. We've got to know when we call men and women from darkness to light, it's going to be awkward. And some will mock us for believing such a narrow thing. And the reason some of us, not all of us, some of us stay silent is we don't want to be mocked. And I don't blame you. I don't want to be mocked. But some were open to hearing more. As he preached... As he articulated these divine truths, as he called for a response, some were not yet there, but they didn't close the door. And then we have that third group that joined and believed. Count me in. I will repent, and that is evidenced by believing. You see how that works? Now, what I'm, what I'm confessing to you guys today is I personally know the struggle to clearly call for a response. I think the Lord has made this known in, in recent months, not intentionally, but the way that I have shared the gospel one-to-one -one and even corporately, I have implicitly called for a response. I have tried to present the evidence for Christ in a manner that just leaves you with this overwhelming clarity of this is what we need to go do. Again, corporately, but even individually. And the Lord has profoundly convicted me. Stevens, do not imply. Be clear. Be explicit. And the moment came to light, I was sharing the gospel with a, a new widower. And he was cast down. And I tell him the good news about Jesus and eternal life. And I mean, it was just, I got pretty excited talking about it. This is good news. And I left the conversation. I went away. Uh, I'm, I'm driving home, actually. And I thought, I never said clearly, sir, you can have this if you will repent and believe. I just threw it out there as glorious. I've never seen the man again. I hope the Lord has brought one of you or somebody else along to say, let me clarify what Stevens didn't make so clear. Call for a response. It's awkward. Call for a response because it's loving. God commands all people everywhere to repent. I don't know who the youngest in the room is, but he's talking to you. Little one, he's talking to you. Repent of your sin and flee to Christ. And I don't know who the oldest in the room is, but he's talking to you. 
Elderly one, repent of your sin and flee to Christ. And he's talking to every one of us in between. Repent and flee to Christ. Will you? Will you? Join with so many of us in cherishing Christ above all. You want the people of Cave Creek to turn from idols to Christ. Four essentials. Meet people where they are. When possible, find a point of agreement. Use that point of agreement as a doorway to have a gospel explanation. And as that is coming towards a close, do better than I have done. Love them well. Call them to action, to respond to this news. We're going to pray. We're going to respond. And I have no idea what God is doing in your heart or our heart today. But I have heard from some of you through text, through after church conversations, you've been off on the shorelines. You dip your foot in wondering about Christ, but you haven't been all in. This repent and believe is all in. And I'm saying today is the day to stop talking about it and to trust Christ and dive in. Will you? Yes, I'm talking to you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, give us humility to receive the Spirit's leadership to repent, to abide in Christ, to believe in your righteous judgment and the sufficiency of the life and death of Christ. Give us faith today to be holy and to walk with you. God, we confess that we have ongoing sin that lives in our hearts and that we minimize our sin by trying to explain it away. God, have mercy on us and bring us to repentance. But some of us, Lord, our conscience is so easily wounded that we think maybe we've lost our salvation or, or you're, now, you're now displeased with us. And God, we pray you would soothe our conscience with the sufficiency and finished work of Christ that we can have assurance of our standing with you. And so we pray that your spirit would move mightily in our fellowship. Unite our hearts to fear your name. And God, we confess that in our fellowship, we are not dwelling in unity. That there are, there are things living in our hearts that are dishonoring to you. And may we confess these things, yes, as one church family, but individually to you. And have them crucified with Christ resurrected in freedom. So God, we commit our, our individual selves to you, our families to you, this one church body to you, praying your will be done in us as it is in heaven. So please move, shepherd, convict, comfort, and commission us to go and be a gospel witness in this community. May we play golf and ride horses and, and ATVs or whatever they're called to the glory of God. May we go and enjoy soccer and local music to the glory of God. May we go and eat the best foods and, and, and eat out of wherever it may be to the glory of God. To be your lights in this community. Have mercy on us. And renew us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.